Just a quick reminder for our monthly Friday prayer meeting. This coming Friday, July the third, seven o'clock in the evening. We will still have it online, and we invite you to join us this Friday as we pray together, united in the Spirit. Let us now come before the Word of God in prayer. Father, we know that to set our mind on the flesh is death, but to set our mind on the Spirit is life and peace. As we come before your Word, fill us with your Spirit and enable us to set our mind on the Spirit. Fill your feeble servant, O God, with your spirit and help me stand firm on the truth and enable me to declare the whole counsel of God in the fullness of your spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On this graduation Sunday, I would like to speak about our identity in Christ. The question of identity is simply, who am I? Who am I? It's one of those foundational questions in life. No human being can go through life without answering this question. The question becomes more intense as you go through adolescence, college, and young adult years. During these years of growth, you need to discover who you are, your true identity in Christ. Only when you are secure in your identity, you are able to face the challenges in life with courage and strength. But if you are unable to resolve this question of identity, then you will be insecure about who you are. You will be easily swayed by what others say about you. And you will give in to peer pressure. So it's very important that you know your true identity. Now, identity is a modern word, and the Lord Jesus does not address the question of identity directly. But he is very wise, and we will see how he addresses the question of identity in his interaction with the rich young man. In our scripture from Luke chapter 18, the man is introduced simply as a ruler. But the same story appears in Matthew and Mark, and from these three Gospels, we know that he is a young man with status and wealth. This young man probably heard about Jesus, perhaps his reputation as a rabbi and a miracle worker. So he comes up to Jesus and asks, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question. But perhaps his question reveals something about his attitude. Apparently, he has been very successful in life. At a young age, he has already become a wealthy ruler. So his question, what must I do, assumes that eternal life is something he can achieve. What do you think? Can you really become good enough for eternal life by doing good things, by committing yourself to a social justice cause, or by giving tithes and offerings? Notice also that the young man addresses Jesus, good teacher. But the Lord Jesus challenges it. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. No one is good. 
It's a startling statement. We all have the desire to be known as a good person. But the Lord Jesus goes against the grain. In fact, this is a freedom statement. He frees us from trying to be known as a good person. He is saying to us, you don't have to prove to others that you are good. No one is good except God alone. Then Jesus addresses the young man in terms of the standard Jewish ethics, the Ten Commandments. He says to them, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And the young man replies in verse 21, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, we are, if, if we are honest with ourselves, can we really say that? Has this young man never looked at a woman lustfully? Has he never spoken falsely about his neighbor? Has he never failed to honor his father and mother? In the Gospel of Mark, there is a little detail that's not there in other Gospels. Mark chapter 10, verse 21 says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Here, the wonderful Greek word, agapao, which is related to agapi, is used, pointing to God's unconditional love. The Lord Jesus is about to confront this young man with something he doesn't want to hear. But Jesus does so because he loves him. Because he wants to save this young man and bring him into God's kingdom. There are times when we need to speak the truth that people don't want to hear. But our motivation should always be love. That is always, that is always intending what is best for them. The Lord Jesus loves this young man and says to him in verse 22, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. This is a hard saying. I don't know about you, but it makes me very uncomfortable. Who among us is willing to sell everything we have and give to the poor? Who among us? Having heard the demand of Jesus, this young ruler becomes sad because he has great wealth. He is only given only two choices, either wealth or Christ. Then Jesus looks at this young man and says in verse 24, how hard it is for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Some commentators speculated that this might be referring to a small gate named the Eye of a Needle. But there is no archaeological evidence that such a gate ever existed in ancient Israel. Jesus is talking about the actual needle that is used for sewing. The response of the disciples indicates that they understood what Jesus was saying. It's not just hard but impossible. So they respond in verse 26, Who then can be saved? Then the Lord Jesus answers in verse 27, What is impossible with men is possible with God. 
The story is very simple, but it has a profound meaning. I believe that the rich young ruler was a decent person, and he came to Jesus with a good intention. It would, been, it would have been much easier for him if the Lord Jesus commanded him to sell only 10% of his possessions. But he commanded him to sell everything he had and give to the poor. We know from the other stories of rich men, for example, Matthew, the tax collector, and Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the Lord Jesus did not demand that they sell everything that they had and give to the poor. So why should Jesus demand this young man to sell everything? Why? I believe that the Lord Jesus is testing this young man's heart. He is going after that which has defined this young man's identity. He is going after the young man's greatest attachment. Jesus is asking him, Who are you without your wealth? Who remains of you? When your wealth is gone, who are you at the bottom of your soul? This is the question of identity. Our identity has to do with the essence of who we are. That's why the question of identity touches something deep in our soul. Because it's so deep in our soul, we don't think about it until it is questioned or taken away from us. The rich young man is forced to consider who he is in the depth of his soul if he were to give up all his possessions. You see, he has constructed his identity based on how much he has, how much he has accomplished, and he cannot bear to imagine his life without wealth because that has become his identity. And the Lord Jesus, out of love, shatters the young man's false identity and he invites him, Come, follow me. The Lord Jesus shatters his false identity in order to rebuild his true identity. As I mentioned earlier, it's very important that we know our true identity and resolve the question, who am I? Especially during teenage and college years, we are trying to discover who we are on the face of enormous peer pressure. So teenage and college years are times of identity crisis, the term coined by Eric Erickson, a developmental psychologist. Today, the identity crisis extends well beyond the college years into young adult and even adult years. Traditionally, we generally had stable social structures, family, church, and community that helped young people develop a stable sense of identity. That's why I've emphasized countless times the institutions that God has established, marriage, family, and church, are absolutely crucial to the formation of healthy identity in our young people. But today, these formative institutions are disintegrating. And young people growing up today are trying to cope with an identity crisis, often without a stable family and church. And their identity is formed more by peer pressures coming from their friends and social media on which they spend many hours each day. They often don't realize the formative power 
of the thousands and thousands of messages and images coming through social media each day. You see, this is a matter of spiritual discipline. We need to learn to use technology wisely for our benefit instead of being used by technology. We need wisdom to discern who is worth listening to and discipline to limit our time on media in general. Using technology wisely is an essential form of spiritual discipline today. Unfortunately, we don't think of it as a spiritual issue, and we allow ourselves to be influenced and pressured by all kinds of voices flooding in from the outside, voices that are shallow, superficial, and impulsive. And these voices tell us who we are. They say, you are how you look. You are what you wear. You are how attractive your body is. You are how much wealth you've accumulated. You are the color of your skin. You are the name of the school you attended. You are the political cause you identify with. You are the gender you yourself constructed. The common theme in all these is this. Your identity is both what you yourself constructed and what others tell you. But here's the problem. If your identity is what you yourself constructed or what others tell you, then it's very fragile, weak, distorted. For example, what if you built your identity on how much you've accomplished? Of course, having the sense of accomplishment is a good thing. That's why we celebrate Graduation Sunday. Whatever you do, whether it be your study or your career, you need to pursue excellence for the glory of God. But you will not always be successful. You will not always enjoy status, especially if you follow Christ, because He often leads you to where you are uncomfortable. Failure is a part of life. There will come a time when you will hit rock bottom and feel like a total failure. If you've constructed your identity on success, then what happens when you experience failures? Your fragile identity will be shattered and you will spiral down towards self-loathing and depression. So what is your identity built on? What is your greatest attachment that you cannot let go? Perhaps you've constructed your identity on that which you cannot let go. You see, the fundamental problem with constructing our own identity is that the way we look at ourselves is distorted by sin. You probably have seen this kind of mirror in an amusement park. Depending on the shape of the mirror, you appear too skinny or too fat, too tall or too short, or completely out of proportion. You see a distorted image of who you are. The identity that you yourself construct is like that. You see yourself in a distorted mirror. And also you see others in a distorted mirror. Racial identity that we ourselves construct is plagued by the same distortion. We see our own race in a distorted mirror. And we see other races 
in a distorted mirror. Racism is universal because sin is universal. Racism is not a unique American problem, though what happened in America was absolutely horrendous. It is a human problem because every human heart is distorted by sin. In the time of Jesus, racism was not based on skin color. Instead, it was based on other things that divided humanity, such as Jews versus Gentiles, even tribal identities among the Jews. The Jews looked down on the Gentiles as dogs and despised them. And the Gentiles, in turn, despised the Jews. In Luke chapter 4, we saw how the Lord Jesus confronted his hometown people for their racism against the Gentiles and was almost killed by his own people. Now, I don't have the knowledge to speak about other cultures. So I would like to speak a little bit about the animosity between Korea and Japan. I am really blessed to have been raised by parents who never had any animosity toward Japanese. In fact, some of their best friends were Japanese. So I am speaking in general about the historical reality. Some of you know something about the Korean culture through K-pop. Unfortunately, K-pop is the most superficial representation of the Korean culture. That's not the Korea I love. The Korea I love is about the depth of relationships marked by kindness generosity, and loyalty. But even that is infected with sin. If you are an outsider living in Korea, you would have a different experience. Of course, there are exceptions, and I'm speaking in general. But suppose your parents migrated to Korea from another country in Asia, and suppose you were born in Korea and you lived in Korea all your life. But it doesn't matter that you look like a Korean and you speak like a Korean. Just because your name is not Korean, you are not fully accepted. You are a second-class citizen. And you will not be able to advance in Korean companies. There is a similar situation in Japan. Suppose you are a Korean born in Japan and you look like a Japanese and you speak like a Japanese, but if you want to advance to a managerial position, you need to change your name to Japanese and suppress your Korean identity. Historically, the enmity between Korea and Japan has exist existed for a long time, but it was intensified by what is called the Asian Holocaust, in which the Imperial Japanese Army killed millions and millions of Koreans, Chinese, Filipinos, and other Asians by massacre, human experimentation, and forced labor. The Japanese military ruled Korea for 35 years, from 1910 to 1945. They tried to eliminate the elements of Korean culture from Korea. They banned the Korean language and forced the Koreans to speak only Japanese. The most atrocious evil was committed against the so-called comfort women who were forced into sex slavery for the Japanese soldiers. These women were either abducted from their homes or recruited 
on false promises and lies, and sold as sex slaves to the Japanese military brothel. It is estimated that 200,000 women were forced into sex slavery. The majority of the comfort women were young Korean women from poor families. Some of them were teenagers. Sex slavery doesn't quite capture what it was. It was a serial rape. These women were raped 20, 30, 40 times a day by Japanese soldiers waiting outside in line for their turn. One comfort woman now in her 90s testified not too long ago, I was born a woman, but never lived as a woman. I feel sick when I come close to a man. Not just Japanese men, but all men, even my own husband who saved me from the brothel. There are many other examples of human brutality against other ethnic groups or other tribes. As God says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Racism is a universal human problem because it's the problem of the heart. We look at others in a distorted mirror, even to the point of treating them as objects to be used and discarded. And because our hearts are distorted, our own racial identity that we construct is also distorted. We think of our own race as superior to others and are blinded to our own sins. And it's not just our racial identity. Every identity that we construct is distorted. Remember how the Lord Jesus challenged the rich young man and shattered his false identity built on his wealth. We cannot build our true identity on top of a false identity. We cannot build on a false foundation. Now I know that this is tough to hear, but our false identity must be shattered, broken down, given up, surrendered. If we don't give up our false identity, then Christ in his great love for us will break it down so that he can rebuild our identity on a firm foundation. Our identity is not something we ourselves construct. No. Our identity is given and received. Our identity is given by Christ and received by faith. What then is this identity given by Christ? It is simple. We are a child of God, redeemed by Christ saved by the blood of Christ. The Lord Jesus, the great I Am, speaks to us. You are my child. You are precious in my sight. You are my beloved. You belong to me. You are engraved in the palm of my hand. You are precious to me. That is who you are. This identity given by Christ is indestructible, imperishable, and everlasting. Even when we have lost everything that we ourselves constructed, when we have lost all our wealth, when we have suffered failure after failure, 
when we are at rock bottom, we are still a child of God, redeemed by Christ. Nothing can take away that identity from us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing, not even death. The Lord Jesus Christ shatters every false identity that we ourselves have constructed to divide people. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Our identity in Christ is what enable us, enables us to transcend racial, social, economic class boundaries and unites us to one another. Then you might ask, what about our uniqueness as Asian, black, white, Latino, or Native American? What about our uniqueness as male or female? What about our unique gifts as an artist, musician, teacher, accountant, or carpenter? Does Christ wipe out our uniqueness? Does being in Christ nullify our uniqueness? Absolutely not. He does not wipe out our uniqueness. In fact, when we surrender our uniqueness to Christ, He sanctifies it, He makes it holy, and gives it back to us. And He makes us all the more unique. He frees us to be who we really are. When we are in Christ, our racial identity is a gift given by our Creator to be received with gratitude. Our racial identity is to be received with gratitude. When we are in Christ, we no longer see others, especially those who are different from us, in a distorted mirror. We see them through the eyes of Christ, and we receive them as a gift from God. When we are in Christ, our body is not our own. Our body is not something we construct. Our body belongs to Christ. And we receive our body as a gift, being prepared to be transformed into an imperishable body on the day of the resurrection. When we are in Christ, our sexuality is not our own. Our identity as male or female is not something we ourselves construct. Our sexuality is a gift from the Creator. For we are fearfully and wonderfully made. When we are in Christ, our possessions, our status, our success are not our own. When we surrender all of them to Christ, all of them, not just 10% of them, He purifies them, sanctifies them, and gives them back to us so that they may be used not for our purpose, for, but for God's kingdom purpose. When we are in Christ, even with all our brokenness and sinfulness, we are secure in our identity. We know who we are. And our confidence comes from Christ. So we don't need to be anxious about what other people think of us. So brothers and sisters, Receive the way God has made you as a gift from God. 
receive even the areas that you are struggling with as a gift from God because the Holy Spirit is working in you to transform those areas. Be whom God has made you to be. Face the challenges in life with courage. Know that you are secure in your identity in Christ. And follow Christ no matter how difficult the way is. Amen.